everyone, my name is Haley Elizabeth, and if you don't know who I am, this is my true crime podcast, Behind You, where once a week I talk about all things true crime, ranging from murders, disappearances, cults, all the way to the biggest drug bust in history, the biggest bang heist in history, all things true crime. So if you're interested in any of that, you can subscribe to the YouTube channel and watch the visual version every Wednesday, or you could go to Spotify, Apple, wherever you could find podcasts every Tuesday for the audio version. And in today's specific video, we are going to be talking about the case of Randy Robert Stare. Now, there is a lot to get through, so we're just going to hop right into it. Born on September 12th, 1992 in Tunhannock, Pennsylvania. As a child, he was described to be a very shy child. He had a very tough time making friends just because he felt like he didn't really relate to anyone. He grew up with his mom, his dad, his brother Jeremy, and his dog. When he was growing up, it's not that he didn't have a like physical rough childhood. He wasn't ever physically abused or anything as a kid, but it was more of a mentally rough childhood. At a very young age, Randy would say that he contemplated death when he was just 11 years old. Randy would go on to say that he absolutely hated his parents. So since he didn't like his family and he also had no friends, he would spend a lot of his time alone and he would spend most of that alone time either watching YouTube videos, drawing cartoons, or making comic books. Going into high school, that is when he kind of found his love for filmmaking specifically. He loved to watch uh, YouTubers such as Smosh, Ray William Johnson, uh, Onision, like all of those very skit sort of channels. Watching all of his favorite YouTubers do that, that is when he decided that he wanted to do the same thing. So on June 9th of 2008 at 16 years old, that is when he made his YouTube channel called Pioneer Productions. And in the beginning of his career, he mostly did like no face cam sort of let's play content. So he would play video games, but just with a voiceover. And then later on, he would start to show his his face and start doing a bunch of skits. From a first glance at his more earlier content, he seemed just like a normal teenage kid. There wasn't really anything alarming to him. At first glance, it just looks like he was a normal teenage kid. Daniel, you missed all of them. This is more disgusting than watching Hello, it's Randy, and I am in Dallas, Texas for the Cowboys versus Redskins game. And right now I'm in the bathroom. I'm trying to be quiet so my parents don't hear me out there. But as you can see, I got a Terrell Owens jersey. And yes, I'm in a bathroom. Let's take a look around, okay? This is our room. Not you! <laughs> see, I told you. Yeah, my brother can be a pain sometimes, but don't tell him that. He would also make parody videos as well, and his very first uh, video that went viral on his account, it got, I think, 11,000 views, which was a lot for his channel, and also just a lot for the time back then. It was a parody of Fred. So then once he started to gain a lot more subscribers on his YouTube channel, that is when he gave himself a stage name, and that stage name was Andrew Blaze. He liked to play video games, he was interested in filmmaking and acting and cartoons, but over the years from 2008 to 2010, it's very scary to watch the progression in his videos because you can slowly start to see by the content of his skits that his mental health is just slowly declining. His videos start to become more and more concerning and he would do a lot of videos and skits that had to do with death, shooting people, guns, and very abusive yelling towards people. If you guys remember like back in the day, all of those very like over-the-top skits uh, that were performed by, for example, like Ryan Higa and Wasabi Productions, like those type of over-dramatic yelling sort of skits, those are the skits that Randy would do on his YouTube channel. 
channel he had a lot of just like sit down talking videos and in these sit down talking videos he would also say a lot of concerning things when i'm not thinking about youtube or my family or what i love i'm always thinking about what happens after you die i want to do everything i possibly can in life before i'm dead and that's just a scary thought it's like everything has to end sometime i'll be dead one day you'll be dead one day it's, it's not good to think about stuff like that i know this is scary stuff but it is just weird and i think about it too much he had mentioned before that he doesn't understand how people can live past 30 he says that whenever he looks at older people like 60 year olds he is just in awe at how they were able to get up every day and continue their life every single day he also says that he feels like he wasn't supposed to be on this earth he said that there was some sort of mistake and the only way to return back to where he came from was by dying it was something that no one really pointed out or kind of saw as concerning. At 18, that is when Randy would start attending college to get his bachelor's in mass communications. Then he would also say very frequently in his videos that he all he wanted to do was pursue YouTube full time. YouTube was his dream and making videos was his dream and so he felt like going to college was such a waste of time and money. Also during these years where he started working on an animated series called The Westboro High Massacre. And this was a film that was heavily dedicated to his quote unquote love of his life, Ember from the cartoon Danny Phantom. This is an obsession that upscales throughout the years that you will see. And I think it's mostly because if you've ever seen the show Danny Phantom, um, Ember in the show is a ghost girl and she had died, but she had come back a ghost and is able to interact with people so maybe that was a reason why Randy enjoyed the show so much specifically Ember but his connection with Ember and this world that he's entering himself into really does contribute to his declining mental health and his disassociation from reality and you really start to see the in-depths of this unhealthy relationship with Ember in 2013 at 21 years old his obsession starts to turn very very cynical. He then starts to go online and say that he believes he is meant to be a quote ghost girl like Ember is and he also creates many many skits displaying what he believes the afterlife is and in his vision of the afterlife he says that when he dies he is not going to go to heaven or hell but he is going to reincarnate as a ghost person and he is going to reunite with Ember. He also had a a lot of gender identity issues during this time that I'll go more in depth in later. Aside from his visions about reality and the afterlife, what was going on around him was very, very traumatic. Uh, during this time, he had experienced a lot of death. Like, for example, his grandfather had passed away when he was in middle school. Randy would say that this was the first time he had ever seen a dead body, and it was also the first time where he really contemplated the idea of death and what death meant the following year in 2006 my grandfather died and that was the first death that just touched close to home for me it made me realize like what you have you know you realize what you have and sometimes you don't realize what you have until it's gone it was like the first time i ever saw like someone like being unconscious or being in a coma and dealing with cancer and stuff like that. One day he was talking and everything and then the next day he was gone. My dad obviously was very depressed after that. Totally changed him for a while and honestly it probably still affects him today. I, I don't know because I fucking hate his guts and I wanted to fucking die. And the funeral I really came close to really bawling but I held it in. Um, and my dad said he was proud of me for dealing with all this very well and all that, but you know, it's just something you shouldn't have to deal with when you're that young. He also says that as like an older teenager, um, his brother's friend Tom had actually passed away in a car accident and this was very, very hard on him because although he wasn't super close with Tom, he did have a connection with Tom. Shortly after that, his very close friend Matt that he had in one of his college classes 
Hayes had also passed away in a car accident. When explaining this in one of his videos, he would even go on to say, quote, Tom's death sucked the life out of me. Matt's death killed me. Doesn't matter what you do, you're gonna die. You'll end up dead one day. It's like right now. Someone right now is going to sleep. They're gonna wake up tomorrow and be dead. Someone's gonna die tomorrow that just went to sleep. And they don't know that. They're gonna go to sleep now, wake up tomorrow, go into the world, and they're gonna die somehow. Car accident, heart attack, some other supernatural force or whatever. Yeah, just... I think about that a lot too, which is weird. I think about death a lot. I mean, I, I take no shame in thinking about dying a lot, but I seriously do think about death all the time, and it's not a good thing. Death is not fun to think about. In a way, it's like an escape. For me, it is. Two years later, at 23 years old, once he graduates college, he doesn't really know what to do with his life. He feels very lost. He doesn't want to do anything in mass communications, and he really wants to do YouTube, but YouTube isn't really working out. The only source of income that he had at this point was a grocery store that he had worked at. It was actually a grocery store that his dad was the manager at, so that's how he got the job. He felt like he just didn't want to work at this supermarket anymore. He wanted to do YouTube for a living. And as you can see from his videos, his mental health was at a very rapid decline. He was starting to say things like how he wants to be a ghost girl. You can start to see him really, really detaching from reality. He's always saying in his videos as well that he doesn't have anyone around him that really cares about him. At 23 years old, that is when Randy started to create his suicide tapes. People documenting their will on tape and saying things like, if you're watching this, I'm dead. I'm sorry, you know. And honestly, I've envisioned this day coming for as long as 10 years. I wanted to record this for you, mom, Jeremy, dad, and really just anyone else in the family that would want to watch it and help maybe help you better understand why I did what I did and how you didn't see it coming and all that and really just to talk to you one last time because obviously now I won't be able to. These tapes from what I could find online is comprised of about 18 videos ranging all from three minutes to an hour and a half and in these videos he talks about how he is planning to die May 7th of 2019 and then he called this series EGS, um, E being the fifth letter of the alphabet, G being the seventh letter, and S being the 19th letter of the alphabet, um, 5719 is May 7th of 2019. These were the tapes that Randy really just spoke about every single little thing that has happened to him. He spoke about every dark obsession he had. He even speaks directly to his family at times as well. Spoke in one of the videos about how he had gender identity issues and that when his brother and parents were gone out of the house, he would frequently put on his mother's clothes, such as her bra and her her just regular clothes. He would also frequently wear female garments underneath his clothing as well. And he also kept a journal and in one of his journal entries, he wrote, quote, I sit here alone on my bed full of emptiness. I'm wearing my girl clothes and my legs crossed. Why am I so damned to spend two to three decades in this disgusting body? I am not a man. Sorry, mom and dad, but I'm not sorry. I'm a woman. Each and every day, it gets harder and harder to live in this body. I'm wearing my female natural selection shirt with my American Eagle bra, panties, and black leggings. I guess the proper term would be transgender, but I don't even fully agree on that. I'm legit a girl trapped inside a boy's body. I am a femme soul. He would also go on to say multiple times throughout these tapes that he really just wanted someone to notice him. He said that as a child, his parents never really gave him attention. He was always overshadowed, even in school by his other classmates. Have someone notice him and so that he feels 
validated that he is supposed to be here but instead he continued to get overlooked and also with him going through his gender identity issues he would often leave his female products like his female bath products just out in the open and in the bathroom specifically to which no one said anything my stuff is obviously here you know i got the skin to mitt stuff skin to mitt my hair product that i use my lady's razor mm, contact stuff and deodorant my lotion you know girl stuff and this is my brother's <laughs> So he always has shit here in the corner, clothes, hats, whatever. He would also go on to say in one of his videos that he had tried to get attention even at school. For his English class specifically, he had to write three different stories just for class. When he turned them in, all three of the stories had to do with the main character dying in a very gruesome and graphic way. He thought that if he did this, then maybe his teacher would pull him aside and ask him if if everything was okay or just have any concern for him at all but Randy said that he just turned in his stories his teacher told him great job and that was the end of that his teacher was not concerned his teacher didn't ask of any questions he also had created this fictional character Mackenzie he felt like in his past life or in another dimension he was actually a woman named Mackenzie and he was dating Ember from Danny Phantom. He would constantly draw out Mackenzie and what she looked like, but his obsession with Amber and Mackenzie later became very, very unhealthy to where he had created an entire world surrounded by Mackenzie and Ember, and he kind of brought Mackenzie and Ember into his actual life. So he actually ran nine different social media accounts, and each social media account had to do with a different character that he would consistently post on and he would even comment on tweets that he was tweeting from one of the accounts and make it look like these two characters were interacting with each other. This was something that he would do to all nine accounts. He would just make them all interact with each other to make it look like they were real people and so his dark obsessions just got darker when in his videos he would start to talk about his fascination with the Columbine shooters and even said that he wanted to make them proud one day. He would also display a lot of racist and homophobic remarks. He would also say a lot of things that were very, very narcissistic. Towards the end of him turning 23 and going on to 24, his animated series, The Westboro High Massacre, was falling through very quickly. He had hired voice voice actors that apparently were not sending him over any voice files. He also had an animator that was going to animate the film, but apparently that animator also declined just because the animator didn't feel comfortable with the concept of the video. With all of these plans falling through, this was the year of uh, like 2017, and he just felt like there was no more hope left. In one of his videos, he said something very, very concerning in that he said the day he uploads his animated series would be the day that he dies and he got to a point where he just said that he couldn't wait off any longer. That is when he went out and he bought two shotguns and later wrote this in his journal. I know the biggest question will be why? I wish I could answer that fully but I can't. It was destined to happen from 1992 and before. I'm from a community and squad of ghosts, and 2017 was my time to go back to them, where my true home is. I'm not mentally ill or schizophrenic or insane, I'm just me. I didn't want to wake up one day and realize that's where I'm from. He basically just goes on to talk about how he believes that he is from a different dimension and he's not supposed to be here and he doesn't want to keep on waking up every single day on earth knowing that he has a purpose somewhere else with his quote-unquote ghost squad. So then shortly after he bought these two shotguns, that is when he would go on his YouTube channel 
home and start posting target practice videos. In his videos, he'd wear this shirt with the words natural selection on it. And if you're unfamiliar with the Columbine shooters, the Columbine shooter Harris, this is the same shirt that he wore. As I said, he had gotten to a point where everything was falling through and he couldn't wait off any longer. Instead of offing himself on May 7th of 2019, he then switched the date to June 7th of 2017 that year. And not only was he going to off himself, he was going to off someone else as well, whether that be his family or his co-workers at the supermarket. He was talking very, very openly on his YouTube channel about how he was going to kill someone and then kill himself. And this was very, very public and yet no one said anything. A week before the massacre, that is when he started to give his family hints or attempt at getting his family hints and he would basically write journal entries, rip it out, and leave it around the house. And one of the journal entries said, quote, you were a fool to trust me with that shotgun. Oh mother, if only you realized you just signed my death warrant by taking me to that gun shop. On May 18th of 2017, he would take to his Embers Ghost Squad uh, Twitter account. This was an account that he made for all of his ghost squad, the same ghost squad that he believes he was going to be reunited with in the afterlife, where he said, quote, if you think your body is ready for June 7th, then you're gravely mistaken. He also tweeted out another tweet on May 20th, two days later, that read, 17 days, is your calendar marked? Hashtag EGS, hashtag big things, hashtag June 7th, hashtag D-E-K Harbs. And there was this one Twitter account that he managed named Rachel Shadows. Rachel Shadows from her Twitter account looked to have a very odd and unhealthy um, obsession with the Columbine shooters, very, very similar to Randy's obsession with the Columbine shooters. He would frequently post things to her Twitter account saying things like, quote, who's ready to die? Hashtag Rachel Shadows, hashtag EGS, hashtag Ember's Ghost Squad, attached with a photo of Rachel's cartoon character holding a shotgun. She would also post another thing that said, quote, when you're gonna die, you gotta die hardcore or not at all. He had said in a video that not only was he going to kill himself, but he also planned on killing someone else, but he wasn't sure if it was going to be his co-workers or his family. And so as the day of June 7th approached, Randy had filmed one of his last videos. It was basically a video talking about who was going to die. And it wasn't something that was really thought out, but it all came down to a simple coin flip. Okay, so here's the deal. Got a 1983 quarter right here. You believe in fate? Here's the fate test. I'm gonna flip this three times, or the best out of three, rather, and if it's heads, I'll do it here. If it's tails, supermarket. Let's go. Best of three. Here we go. touch it. You will see it as I see it. If I can find it. There it is. That's the tails. See that? Two. Looking at it. You as I will see it for the first time. It had to be, right? That's a heads. Ooh, one of each. Tension's building up. This is crazy. This is just crazy. Having this come down to the flip of a coin. All right, number three. That was a high one. Don't lose it. Can't lose that coin. There we go. Oh, it's a tails. That's tails. There we go. Now you can see it. Tails. 
which means there's gonna be a loss of a human life besides my own. Possibly more than one. That's fate for you. From that simple coin flip, that is when he made the decision that his co-workers were going to die. So that is when he went online and made his last video. What happened? What the f*** happened, man? This is surreal right now, but I can't believe I'm saying this, but I think this is going to be my last video. I don't know what will happen to my channels after this. I don't know what people are going to think of me after this. It doesn't bother me, but just looking at everyone at the supermarket, the manager's coming in, ah, da, 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 just messing around and talking about this, and four more nights, your whole lives are going to be turned upside down because of me. I'm going to f*** your life up. I can't wait. I want that supermarket to be closed for like a f month or go out of business. It's a crime scene. <laughs> it's going to be a crime scene. And then... It'll be over. Whoever would have thought that a cartoon character would cause this to happen. A cartoon character. How can a cartoon character bring all this out in you? How is that even possible? The biggest question will always be why. I like partially told you why. I'm not gonna tell you everything. And there's stuff that you still don't know about me that I'll never tell you. I'll take it to the grave. Em, you want a chip? <laughs> I'm not a psychopath. I don't hunt people down and kill them. <laughs> take away YouTube, I'm nothing. I mean, there's other dimensions out there besides Earth. There's going to be a big eternal war. I will be laughing my white ghost female ass off when I get messages saying, you know, I help people get through dark times or I change their life, you know, or my videos make them laugh their ass off or put a smile on their face. You know, that's that's all I ever really wanted deep down. I just it wasn't there in the beginning. Like in the beginning, I just wanted to be like, I wanted to get famous from it. That was pretty much it. But I was like Onision that had an actual decent fan base pretty much. Personally, I actually used to watch Onision back in 2009. <laughs> sort of went like, all right, he's making really weird that I don't care about. So, cause he would cross dress and I'm like, uh, no thanks. Even though I cross dress myself, <laughs> it's kind of funny. Pretty similar with some things we view. <laughs> I say really brutal shit on Twitter sometimes, but people support it sometimes. It blows my mind. It's like, cool. It's a man's world. Men, women are better. I'm gonna miss you guys. I really am. My emotions just aren't what they used to be. Yet the most random thing in the world can make me cry, but things that are supposed to make you cry, they don't. Let it go and Frozen made me cry. A lot. Not just once, numerous of times. Like almost every time I'd watch the movie and I watched the movie like, 20 times. Life's real short. Sometimes it feels like an eternity, but life's so damn short. And look at me. I, it's like I blinked and I was 24 and a half. I sit here and I ask myself, would I do it all over again if I could? I'm gonna be dead before next week ends. I'll be dead. Legit dead. This is it. So, okay. I'll miss you guys. I'll miss you a lot. Some of you, maybe I'll see you on the other side. And this is Andrew Blaze signing off for the last time. Enjoy the rest of your lives. Andrew. Out. June 6th of 2017, the day before he planned on the massacre at the supermarket, he posted a very eerie video. It was a completely silent video of him just giving a tour of the supermarket that he worked at. He has worked at this supermarket since he was 17 years old and now he's a 24 year old man. So he's been working there for seven years. There's also some parts in the video where he zooms in on the exits and then on June 7th of 2017 this was the day that his animated series was released. As far as what the whole animated portion is about, I wrote it down just so I wouldn't forget. Randy describes his hatred towards the people involved with the series through an angry prologue. And then it features a crudely animated sequence depicting him and one of the characters from the Ember Ghost Squad murdering students at a fictional high school before ending it with montages of previous videos explaining the motives behind the shooting. And this video was uploaded to his YouTube channel just hours before the massacre had occurred. Also a portion of the video where he's getting two shotguns and he in the video named his shotguns Mackenzie and Rachel after, if you're familiar with the Columbine shooters, Harris, he actually named his guns as well. He 
also in the video features his shotguns with tape around the handles, very similar to what Harris did in the Columbine shooting. That day on June 7th, Randy was actually working the overnight shift at the supermarket. So technically on June 8th, it was a little bit past midnight. That is when 24 year old Randy Stair was working his night shift at 9.02 p.m. That is when he would post to his McKenzie Twitter account saying, quote, I hope we were able to get you through the day. I always hate goodbyes, but it's more like a see you later. Thank you. And then later on that night, he had also uploaded another tweet that was titled journal and attached was a media files, which is kind of like um like a google drive and in that drive was all of his tapes that he had made his animated series all of his plans to kill his co-workers and this happened just a couple hours before the massacre one specific file um within this drive that was titled the andrew blaze suicide tapes and that is when he featured all of his tapes from the moment he decided to kill someone to that present day where he was going to kill someone. At 11.41 p.m., that is when he posted to the Rachel account and said, quote, me and Andrew are going to give the world a little insight as to what really lurks around in the shadows of your everyday lives. When he says me and Andrew, as I said, Randy went under the alias of Andrew Blaze. It kind of implies that the uh, massacre that Andrew is about to commit or Randy is about to commit, he's not doing it alone. He's doing it with his ghost squad. Randy was working with his four other employees and they all had been working all day. This was late in the night, so they were obviously all very tired. There was no customers in there. Everyone was just kind of minding their own business, restocking shelves. And so since since everyone was kind of just tired and doing their own thing, they saw Randy walking around but weren't really paying attention to what he was doing. But what Randy was doing, he was in the process of blocking all all of the exits. He would take these big pallets, stack them in front of the doors, all of the exits, so when he began his massacre, there would be no way for the people to leave. A little after 1 a.m., that is when Randy is finished with blocking off all of the doors, he then grabs two shotguns and he begins to act out on his plan. In the store was him and his four co-workers, 25-year-old Victoria Brong, 47-year-old Brian Hayes, 63-year-old Terry Lee Sterling, and 25-year-old Kristen Newell. Kristen was in the same aisle as Victoria and they were both restocking the shelves together. Both girls had their headphones on just listening to music because as I said, this was the end of the night so they were just kind of doing their work. Kristen is restocking the shelves but then Victoria goes to the end of the aisle to grab more labels for their restocking. As Kristen is restocking the shelves, she randomly hears very loud popping sounds followed by a big thud. But in reality, that popping noise was actually the sound of Randy's shotgun. Kristen later looks up to see what that popping noise was, and Kristen said that when she looked up, all she saw was Randy standing at the end of the aisle with a shotgun in his hand and looking down at Victoria, who was lying on the floor in between them. He looked up from Victoria's body and made eye contact with Kristen, and they made eye contact for a few seconds before Randy just walked away and went into the next aisle. Kristen was in complete shock at to what she just saw and what she was experiencing. She didn't really understand what was going on, but when panics start to set in, she starts to run to an exit, but when she realizes that all of the exits are blocked off, she goes to hide. That is when she gets on the phone with the police, and from Kristen's account of events, she said that shortly 
after Randy and her made eye contact and he walked away, Randy walked to the next aisle where 63-year-old Terry Lee Sterling was, but she's unsure where in the store Brian was. All she can really remember from that specific moment is that she was trying to run out of there and she was trying to hide and she was also on the phone with the police trying to get help. Whilst on the phone with the police, she starts to hear more and more gunshot sounds and so in a panic, she runs to a specific exit door and in this moment, she said that she had a complete blackout moment where she does not remember how she was able to open up the door or um, move all of the pallets out of the way, but by something in her, she was able to do it and she was able to get through the door into the parking lot and she ran for her life across the parking lot. She went to go hide in a nearby bush and she was in this bush while she was on the phone with the police and waiting for the police to arrive and Kristen said that while she was on the phone with the police, she could still hear the gunshots going off from inside. Inside the grocery store is when Randy had shot 63-year-old Terry and 47-year-old Brian Hayes. After all of his co-workers were dead, that is when he starts to randomly open fire at random objects in the grocery store. He started to open fire at the deli counter. He was shooting flower displays, the food on the shelves, and he even tried to shoot propane tanks in hopes of blowing up the grocery store with him in it, but for some reason the propane tanks weren't going off. After shooting just random things around the store, that is when he walked to the deli and that is when he shot himself in the mouth. Prior to offing himself, that is when he tweeted out one last tweet. He tweets out to not his um, like Ghost Squad Twitter account, but to his actual Andrew Blaze Twitter account where he says, quote, goodbye humans, I'll miss you. That is when the police arrived and they were examining the crime scene. When just looking at the crime scene and also knowing nothing about Randy, the police only saw Randy as a grocery store worker and didn't know anything about him. They didn't know what his motive for this would have been. So that is when they decided to get a warrant to search Randy's home. When they searched his home, they found seven boxes of 12 guys shotgun ammunition, shotgun goggles, earplugs, and a shotgun buttstock. They also confiscated all of Randy's notebooks and computers, and once they got hold of his notebooks and computers, that is when everything became clear to police. They watched through all of the tapes that he had made, all of the skits that he had made, how openly he was just vlogging his entire plan from beginning to end, yet no one said anything anything. He tended to take a lot of his trauma and how to cope with that trauma was disassociation of reality due to him creating this whole world of his ghost squad, but also they saw big signs of narcissism and Randy even says himself that he believes he is a narcissist. At one point in his tapes, even told his family that if they wanted to sell his posters that he had in his room that they can and that in the back of all of his posters was his autograph because he believed that he was going to be worth millions one day. Once the police were able to see everything that I just showed you, all of the tapes, all of the clips, all of the journal entries, it became very, very clear from beginning to end how rapidly his mental health was spiraling. They also found that before the massacre, the girl that voiced Ember in the animated series that he had uploaded that day, Randy had actually sent her off an email right before um, the massacre had occurred. He even went on the site and ranked her and less than an hour later is when when the massacre had happened, showing that Randy 
didn't really have any remorse or any nerves about what he was about to do. He was more of just tying up all of his loose ends. In the email that he had sent off to the voice actor, he was saying things such as when she reads this email, he would be dead and that he had found his quote, true purpose and how he believed that when he died, he would cross over into the animated world and be reunited with his animated ghost squad of nine people people that he had created. There was also parts in his tapes where he would refer to Ember as a goddess and would frequently say, oh my goddess, instead of oh my god. They also saw from his journal entries from beginning to end and just the timeline of everything, they saw that Randy was clearly growing more and more depressed and especially after Tom and Matt had passed away, this really, really took a toll on him. So they assume that possibly his way of coping with death was to just detach from reality all in all. He felt like if he wasn't in this world, things would be better. So he mentally put himself in another dimension so that he didn't have to deal with what was going on in his personal life. Aside from the evidence, the bodies were taken into autopsies. And right now I'm about to read you the autopsy reports. Randy's autopsy showed that his cause of death was shotgun to the mouth. He was found with black eyeliner makeup on his eyes as well as on his lips. They also note that Randy was wearing female garments underneath his male clothing and his toxicology report showed that he was found with diphenhydramine. I think that's how you pronounce it, which is basically like Benadryl. And the normal dose for someone his age and his height and weight is typically 15 milliliters. And the fact that he had 372 milliliters in his system is considered an overdose. And this excessive amount of Benadryl in his system could cause him to experience things such as agitation, confusion, hallucinations, and cardiovascular disorders disturbances. And so Randy's first victim that night was Victoria Todd Brong. Victoria's autopsy showed that she suffered gunshot wounds twice in the left hip, once to the anterior chest, and once to the back of the head. Randy's second victim was Terry Lee Sterling. He was shot twice, once in the upper back and once in the left shoulder. Since he was shot only in the back, it was assumed that possibly Terry heard the gunshots and attempted to run before being shot by Randy. And he was also found with multiple pellets in his head, neck, and chest. Randy's final victim that night was Brian Hayes. Brian Hayes's autopsy showed that he was shot five times in the head, chest, right flank, which is basically like your right side, groin, and left arm. Since Randy did pass away, there was no trial. There was nothing they could really do from then on except just try to heal from everything that happened. Kristen did survive the entire incident. When the police had showed up, she was taken to the station to give her statement. As far as the aftermath of it all, a lot of psychologists have tried to piece together Randy's world and try to really figure out what may have triggered him to plan a massacre for an entire year. He had lots of time to turn back. He had lots of time to say no. He had lots of time to think about what he was doing and the repercussions of what he was doing. Even though he may be dead, he would be hurting a lot of people, a lot of families. As far as Randy's criminal record, there really wasn't anything that Randy did that was very out of the ordinary. He never got arrested. He never did hard drugs or unhealthy drinking quite regularly. He never got involved with the wrong crowds because he really didn't have any friends. So there was no external signs that showed that Randy was a bad kid or he was going down a bad route. As you can see from his tapes, Randy did try to show people that there was something wrong, but he was being constantly overlooked. And I'm not trying to say that in a way of like, Randy is a victim because 
there are a lot of people that go through very, very similar situations and come out of it very well. They come out of it very healthy. They get the help that they need as they get older. And there are a lot of people that don't feel the need to kill others. There are also a lot of psychologists that say that Randy was suffering from a very deep, deep depression. And for those who don't know, when depression gets untreated for a long time, there is a chance of developing psychotic features or psychotic symptoms. Randy was constantly coming in and out of reality and was looking for others opinions of him to see if he was truly quote-unquote crazy or not by doing things such as leaving out his feminine uh, products, leaving around very concerning journal entries around the house, buying two shotguns and just leaving them in his room. And it's also speculated that during this time, because there were a lot of people wondering why Randy just looked past Kristen and why he never killed her. A lot of people uh, point this off to be, as I said, he had an excessive amount of Benadryl in his system that would typically make him feel very drowsy. He would have hallucinations. He would have all of these symptoms. So, it is believed that when he saw Kristen, he was starting to disassociate and instead of killing her, he just walked away to the next aisle. But on the opposite end of that, there are a lot of people that speculate that maybe Randy did that on purpose because he knew that if someone was alive from the massacre, then people would continue to talk about him way after his death. Afterwards, um, the town did have a memorial for all of the victims and at this memorial, uh, Randy's father actually spoke out. He said, quote, our thoughts and prayers are with the victims and their families. We are so sorry for all the pain and loss of life this has caused everyone involved. On June 8th of 2022, prior to this, Kristen has never came out to the press publicly with her face, but as of this year, she did come out to the press. She's finally able to tell her story and she has gone through lots of therapy in order to cope with all of this. And whilst telling her timeline of stories, she also mentions that even to this day, every June 9th, she releases balloons in the memories of all of the victims that had passed. She understands that she was very blessed to be the only one that came out alive, but now since she is living, it is her job to keep alive the memories of those who weren't as lucky. At one point in the interview, the interviewer asks Kristen, you know, it's been five years, how do you feel about it? Has anything really changed for you? And Kristen just replies no. She says that she is still having nightmares about the experience. She still goes through a lot every single day. And even as far as a society, nothing has changed in the past five years. Gun laws are nearly the same. Anyone can obtain guns and they are still within easy access to young kids like Randy. And that is very, very scary. She doesn't know why why he decided to let her live but she is glad that he did let her live because although she doesn't know her true purpose in life yet, she knows that she was put here and she survived for a reason. And that is the end of today's story. It was very, very heavy. I understand because this was something that I kind of struggled with too when I was researching into this. When you hear about Randy and his situation, it makes you wonder that even if Randy did get help, would he still be the same way he is now? Or maybe if Randy had a lot more supportive of a friend group where if he were to transition or if he were to really express himself, would that have changed anything or was is just a part of his brain chemistry to act out in violent ways if that would have helped but that's the thing. We don't know if that would have helped. We don't know if it would have made it worse and we will never know if that would have made it better or worse and there are a lot of times that you tend to feel like 
bad for Randy, but then you're reminded of the terrible, terrible things that he had done and you immediately lose all of that sorriness for him. But the main thing to remember about this story is the victims, innocent people with families and loved ones and children and and all they wanted to do was get their shift over with so they could go home to those families and go to bed and sleep in their own bed but unfortunately they weren't able to and I feel like you have to keep on reminding yourself of that if you do feel pittiness for Randy because that's sort of the thing we will never know if help would have actually helped him. Those are just some observations that I made when researching about the case. You could literally comment below and be like, Haley, actually this is the way that works and I'd be like, oh my god, you're so right. I changed my opinion because I'm given a new perspective. But yeah, leave in the comments below any thoughts, questions, concerns you have. If you go ahead and do your own research about Randy's case or if you have done research about Randy's case and there something that I didn't mention or just something that I didn't find in my research that you feel is very interesting, put that in the comments below. I'm pretty sure everyone would want to hear that. Yeah, that is the end of today's video. If you guys found this video interesting, make sure to give it a thumbs up if you're on YouTube or if you're on Spotify or Apple, make sure to rate it five stars. Make sure to be safe out there, make good choices, go outside today, get some fresh air, read a good book, eat a good meal, hang out with your friends, tell someone you love them, even if that person is yourself, and just take care of yourself today, okay? And I will see you guys next week.